So I'm um, excited to welcome you to our third in a series of six March uh, lectures, talks, uh, Did You Know? And the genesis of this was uh, our education committee, um, of which I'm chair, and I'm Deborah Foster of the Board of Trustees. Uh, we were talking all the time when Bill was trying to get us to pay attention. We usually go aside and say, did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know we had George Washington's teeth? I mean, or the dead cat, or the horse, whatever it is. Um, and we thought of it, we have over 100,000 items in our, our holdings. And Henry Sheldon was such a wonderful eccentric, as was his brothers, that it would be great to share more of what we have and the many resources that we have within our community, with our community. And uh, we have some very talented and well-spoken, nationally recognized, sometimes internationally recognized individuals who are members of the museum and who live here in Addison <coughs> County. And today I'm excited to introduce uh, Amy Oxford, who Bill will give a, a more detailed biography of. Um, and if you have any ideas for a future uh, presentation, um, I'm already looking forward to next year. We already have some folks who have volunteered, and um, we're excited about offering this to the community and to our members. So let me introduce Bill Brooks, who will introduce Amy, and thank you all for coming. Well, well, first time <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Um, First, I want to thank Deborah, as head of the Education Committee, who put this series of talks together. Um, so she's done a great job. And I want to recognize my associate, Mary Manley, who many of you know, who's the associate director of the museum. She's been here for 20 years. She's a real veteran, and the place couldn't run without her. And uh, we also have here today Suzanne Douglas, Suzanne helps out at the front desk on usually on weekends. Right now she's helping out in addition to that. And we have where's Judy Watts? Right in front of you. Oh, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> right <up in> <laughs> <laughs> His husband has been on the uh, a trustee and Judy and and Jack. They have a place on Side of the Road and they, they often had events um, supporting the Sheldon Museum. So thank you. And we're lucky today uh, to have John Corbett, MCTV, who's going to film this, uh, so more people can enjoy it. So I was, I went to, to the website uh, and of Amy, and luckily I spoke to her because part of her talk is going to be introducing her background. So I'm going to let her do all that. Except if she doesn't tell you, she grew up in Long Island. <laughs> and uh, then her, her family moved to London for six years while she was a teenager. And among her other accomplishments there, she told me today that she bicycled from downtown London to Stonehenge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's over 100 miles. Her mother was not real happy about it, uh, but she did it successfully. And I was privileged to get to know Amy when I came to Vermont in 1997 to run Frog Hollow of the Vermont State Craft Center. And Amy had, had had her studio there before I came, and then she was a major, uh, dis she displayed her rugs there, and she taught classes, and she's taught a lot of classes throughout the years. So she's a real public servant. She and her husband, in addition to having the studio in Cornwall, they live there, his name is Peter, uh, she has a daughter and now two grandchildren who have moved to Moncton, and she loves to babysit at least one after uh, noon a week. So it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, who we actually gave an award to in 1991 at Frog Hollow, uh, Amy Oxford. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Deb, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Will you turn my mask? Yes. What about that? Here's your remote. That's a wrapped up in your intro. Run this over. Reserved. No, that's reserved for you. Oh, just in case. <laughs> By the way, can I ask you, did, did Deborah, did, did that flashing thing come up during? No, it didn't. Oh, that's fine. No, well, then it's fine. We should be over. Just 
just in case. Well, thank you everyone for coming. We're just waiting for this to warm up. There we go. So um, today I'd like to talk to you about punch needle rug cooking, of course, and I want to talk about the origins of punch needle rug cooking and also how it's grown, how it declined quite drastically, and um, its revival in Vermont. And we'll finally talk about the Instagram explosion that has um, taken off and really put Punch Needle on the map all over the world. Punch Needle rug hooking um, is a technique that started in the 1880s. The first hook rugs were made with a rug hook, called a rug hook because they are literally a hook put in a piece of wood. And you're welcome to come up later. I've um, brought a lot of antique punch needles and antique rug hooks. Can everyone hear me all right? Mm -hmm. um, so a rug hook is just a little a bent hook. And the early rugs were made starting in the 1830s when burlap was first um, produced in the United States. Before that, everything was imported. <coughs> and the technique was cutting up old clothing, old fabric, and on grain sacks, pulling up loops. Um, can you imagine how that would work, just pulling up a loop one at a time? So very, very popular in the 1830s to the 1880s, and extremely popular still today. I know a lot of you are um, traditional rug hookers. In 1881, Ebenezer Ross, who was a farm machinery manufacturer from Toledo, Ohio, invented the first punch needle. It was called the Griffin, and it was patented in 1881. And I actually almost died when my brother-in-law found me one at a yard sale. <laughs> and they look barbaric now. Um, what I think happened is that um, Ebenezer Ross saw either his um, daughter or his wife um, or someone making a rug with a hook and here we are at the Industrial Revolution and he's thinking now, how can I get a machine to do that more efficiently and more quickly so this is really a crazy invention it has a little spring that releases I don't know can you see that mm -hmm. from where you are so all of the punch needles have this little tongue I don't know. Can you see that if I show you oh, yeah. against there? So it's like a little forked tongue, and what it does is it pushes down the yarn. All these early punch needles work with a tongue pushing the yarn down. So if we go back to here, this is my punch needle, the Oxford punch needle, which comes much later. But all punch needles punch down loops and traditional pull-up loops. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, what I do, punch needle rug cooking, is actually sort of upside down rug cooking. You work from the back, so all of your images have to be backwards. A welcome mat would have to say, a you, for example. <laughs> so I think um, Mr. Ross's loved ones must have seen this one and said, well, honey, it's nice, but could you make it a little bit smaller? <laughs> so this was the next one to come along. Punch needle rug cooking is really interesting to me because there have been so many punch needles. After the griffin, and here you can see her punching. From 1881 to 1932, there were over a hundred different punch needles invented, and I probably have about 115 of them. Mm -hmm. um, they're easy to collect because no one knows what they are. Um, they're at flea markets, antique stores, and people's sewing baskets. And I think the thing that made them so tempting for inventors is starting right with Ebenezer Ross. There's got to be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone saw the punch needles before and said, we could make it better. So these are some of the punch needles from my collection. And I don't travel with the boxes because they're so old and brittle. So 
so you can see these are like egg beaters. Mm -hmm. So I just want to show you the actual tools quickly and give you a little overview. After Mr. Ross did the Griffin, he came up with this one. It's called the Jewel. It's also patented in 1881. And it works on a back and forth mechanism. And we call these the violin type because they're you know, a little bit like a violin. And it's, it's a shuttle. It goes back and forth and it's got that little snake tongue. And every time you push it down, it pushes a loop and then it walks itself forward, which is incredibly clever. And it actually walks it forward the right distance to make your stitches the right size. So Mr. Ross was really on to something. He also invented this one, which works on the same principle. And then he decided, let's try it out of wood. And the funniest thing has happened with the evolution of the inventing of punch needles is that they've gotten simpler and simpler. So, you know, he started with all the um, springs and levers, and then he figured out that all you really needed was that forked tongue pushing the yarn down. So he got rid of all those complicated parts, and now he just has two pieces of wood connected by this. So it's getting more and more clever. Um, this one is one of my favorites. It's got little holes. It looks like it was made out of a cribbage um, <laughs> scorekeeping board, but same thing, just back and forth. Um, this is the only thing I collect is antique punch needles, and I, I really hyperventilated when I found these. <laughs> Aren't they fabulous? So that's the violin type, the wooden type. And over time, um, they started making them with metal. So this is the same violin type, the same walking one. And again, come up later, I've got five or six of that type here. The next step in that evolution um, is this trombone type. And it works like this, also punching down with the tongue. And it's got different um, adjustments, so you can make your loops different heights. So there are a lot of those. And my personal favorite is the egg beater type. This is my oldest egg beater. Oh. Um, Peter and I think it was made from toaster tongs. <laughs> <laughs> and they've gotten more and more advanced with the egg beater type going right to this Danella, which is a modern punch needle made in Denmark. And this one is very clever because you can turn it this way and it goes one way. And then if you turn it the other way, it flips the needle and it goes backwards. So you can go back and forth, which is very clever. Um, some of them are quite barbaric. Um, look at this one. This one, I mean, come on, um, was made in Japan. And this one, I mean, it looks like a torture device, don't you think? <laughs> so I just love seeing the old punches. What happened over time is we realized that you didn't even need that tongue. You just needed something to push down the yarn and that it's the tension of the rub backing that's holding the yarn in there. So we've gone all the way from this to realizing that all you needed was a simple tube. So punch needles now are just a handle with a metal, you thread the yarn through, or the strips of fabric, and you punch. And they've gotten more and more um, high, high tech. This one you can actually punch with, and it has a little, if you can see it. It's got a little, can you see the little barb on the top? Um, what this little barb does is every time you punch down, it makes a hole ahead of where you've just been to show you where to go next, which I thought was a clever innovation. So there are literally dozens and dozens of that tubular kind. Um, when I learned to punch, we used the Craftsman's punch needle. Mm -hmm. This was um, the punch needle of choice for many years, and it's still a, a very good tool. So, so 
something about building a better mousetrap um, sort of train of thought really took hold with the punch needles. By the late 1970s, only a handful of people were teaching punch needle row cooking in the USA. There was um, really so few people teaching and so few businesses doing it. It was becoming a dying art. One of the main teachers was George Wells from the George Wells Rotary in Long Island, New York. And he actually just lived right down the road from where I live. We went there for a second grade field trip. And you know how as a child you remember things that are completely off the wall. All I remember about the ruggery was an enormous sink. That's all I remember. And I remember asking Mr. Wells, why do you have such a big sink? And he said, it's because we drain out all the yarn. We have lots of yarn. So that's my ruggery remembrance. Um, Magnum rugs are really the business that brought punch needle rug cooking back, and that's the Vermont um, connection, the Vermont the renaissance of punch needle rug cooking. This is Cynthia and Preston McAdoo. Cynthia um, started McAdoo Rugs, and she started it later in life when her husband retired. She and her husband were both avid sailors, and they traveled. Um, up and down the coast of Maine and stopped at different harbor towns. And they stopped at one town and there were women selling hooked rugs on the side of the road. And she looked at the rugs and she said they weren't very attractive. They were um, Sears robot sort of patterns of rugs. And she saw all the poverty and thought if these women had more beautiful designs, they could do so much better. So she just got this bee in her bonnet, she went home to New Jersey, designed hooked rugs, learned to hook rugs, she had never hooked at all, and she learned from Mr. Wells, and um, learned to dye yarn, and she proceeded to create kits, and put them all in her station wagon, and drove back up to Maine, and started giving people jobs, making McAdoo rugs, so that's how it started. Where was she in Vermont? Um, she was in Maine, and um, her son Preston um, took it over um, in 1978. So it started in 1972 with Mrs. McAdoo. So she um, did just absolutely gorgeous designs, and I um, had a lot of really great conversations with her. And one I said, what is your, your secret to your designing? Do you have any suggestions for um, rug designers? And she said, well, I always start with a martini. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I met Cynthia and Preston McAdoo. Um, when I went to Bennington College, I was actually their babysitter. <laughs> And um, when Preston McAdoo took over, um, I saw the hook rugs and just, I was dying to learn. So I got a job. I was one of their first rug hookers. And they worked in this beautiful red mill, which was just full of rugs and yarn and color. And it was just a gorgeous place to be. This was one of um, Mrs. McAdoo's first kits that she took up to Maine. And when you worked for them, this was the first rug that you made. And the um, little fish are from an Eskimo um, artwork. And what you did was you hooked a little piece first. And if you showed um, inclination to do it well, you were able to go on to the first piece. And I loved working for them. I worked as an at-home rug hooker. And it was perfect because I could be home with my daughter, who was a baby, and it was a really fun job. I want to just show you a lot of um, McAdoo rug designs. All hook rug designs can actually be categorized as pictorials, florals, and geometric rugs. I got to help catalog the hook rugs at Shelburne Museum. There are 420 hook rugs there. And believe it or not, when we categorize them, they all fit into those categories. Some of them were floral geometrics, but um, they all did fit. And I know this is a rug that Suzanne Douglas likes very much, and we'll soon have a pattern of. 
is the large stag hunt. If you look at the background, they use multiple colors in the background to get that sort of tweedy look. One thing that was very important to Mrs. McAdoo was that a rug look well from any part of the room. So you'll often see rugs that are um, multi-directional like this. So Preston married uh, Cynthia McAdoo, another Cynthia McAdoo. So this one is designed by his wife. She also designed the elephant and fruit. When Preston first started designing, he was trying to figure out how to do primitive art when you're actually a trained artist. He um, got his degree in fine arts, um, University of Colorado, so he asked his daughter to draw cows for him. So that's why the cows have eyelashes, which I think is really <laughs> I think she was eight when she drew that. So here's some zebra, and here's an even more dramatic zebra. <laughs> this was actually one of their best sellers. <laughs> so they were written up in the New York Times in the early 80s and really just exploded. They had, in their heyday, over 50 rugs working for them. They had seven designers. They made um, rugs for shows, and what Preston did was he was invited to um, put on shows by private organizations and individuals. So someone might um, be raising money for a children's hospital, for example. So he would come and do a rug show and 40% of the profits would go to that hospital. So he was great about that. So they never said anything about it being a non-profit business. You know, they gave people jobs without making a big brouhaha about it. They donated a ton of their money. Um, and they were not a non-profit, but they never made really any money. <laughs> um, it was out of the goodness of their hearts. Did they ever sell kits where you could make the rug, or were they all uh, the rugs were made? Yes, good question. And feel free to ask questions as I go. When I started working for them, I asked them if they had kits, and they said, Preston said, and I know he wouldn't have wanted me to repeat it then, but I think I can say it now. He said, no, because we didn't want a bunch of badly made McAdoo rugs out there. Um, but he softened, and over time they did sell kits. Amy, as you go through those, would you tell us whether they're geometric or floral? Oh, sure. Because there were floral geometric ones. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> this is a pictorial. And this is a pictorial as well, but I guess it is a little bit geometric because it's got the cross hatching on the background with the leaves. Pictorial. Um, they had thousands of rug designs and every kind of dog you could ever imagine. Um, and they would custom, they did a lot of custom rugs. They made about 2,000 rugs a year, um, including a lot of custom rugs. They made rugs for all kinds of celebrities. I have a who's who book of McAdoo rugs. They made a, um, a fried egg rug for Mary Tyler Morris. <laughs> Um, kitchen. If you can imagine a big fried egg, that's what she wants. <laughs> so Mrs. McAdoo was so good at expressions. You know, she said that it was really common for her to spend, say, two hours designing this rug, but four hours getting that face. You know, to get a Jack Russell to look coy, you know, is not an easy thing. But she was so good at capturing expressions. And this would be um, a pictorial with a geometric border. <laughs> they did a lot um, of all kinds of animals, but I'm going to show you some poultry. <laughs> this is a pictorial designed by Cynthia McAdoo the Younger. This is called Naughty Chickens. <laughs> and you can see um, these chickens fighting over a worm. Oh. 
couple Dominique roosters, also a pictorial. They used lots of different colors in their background, and one of their styles was what I call sort of those amoeba shapes. And it was really fun to work for them because if you showed artistic inclination, they would say, okay, here's eight colors, do whatever you want for them with the background. When I went to visit though once, they had a list on the wall of all of the um, different rug hookers and who had what rug, and one of them next to their name, it said, do not give Holsteins. <laughs> <laughs> and why it was just too confusing for that person. <laughs> um, Preston took designs from all different um, times in art history and was greatly inspired by different rugs in history. Oh. Also a pictorial, but look, in the, look at the motion of that. Mm -hmm. And the colors are such beautiful saturated colors. They had a real palette of their own. When Preston started, he spent the first six weeks doing nothing but designing his line of colors, dyeing until he got, um, he had over 300 colors that he loved. So the rugs have a definite look because that's what they used was their palette. Their rugs were very thick. Um, they did a lot of their rug shows in um, Maine, so they had a lot of nautical themes, a lot in Florida, so you'd see a lot of, um, you know, beautiful um, birds and fish and things. But look at the white caps there. Mm -hmm. And the sky is very pretty, the gradated sky. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that have so much motion? Yeah. So yeah. Katie, did they dictate that they wanted that type of effect for the yeah. sky or the what or was that up to the artist who was executing? That's a really good question. Um, what we would get was sort of hook by number. We would get the monk's cloth with the design drawn on it. We would get a map showing what colors went where and a bag full of balls of yarn with the little numbers on them and we would line them up. For something like this, it would be really clearly dictated, the color sequence mm -hmm. for the water and how many rows of color. For the sky, where there's just all this wonderful, crazy stuff happening, it might show which ones were white, and then we get to fill in the rest as we wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, about how long would it take to make a rug? Um, we were paid to make a square foot in three hours and it was minimum wage at the time. And I never got that fast. I could do a square foot in about five hours. So if you were doing you know, a white sail, that's very quick. But when you get into making all these little people, that little area would take like five times longer than that little sail. So um, yeah, and what we would get is it would say how many hours we were expected to make it in, and I just threw that out. You know, I knew I could never do it. But it was great, because I could do it at home. Mm -hmm. This is another one by Cynthia McAdoo. Mm -hmm. Also considered a pictorial. But aren't they fabulous? I mean, look how crazy this lady is. Mm -hmm. And um, Cynthia did a lot of designs from things that came to her in dreams. They did a lot of um, scenes of local, um, local things, including this farmer's market, pictorial. They did many florals. This is floral as opposed to This is a floral geometric, very good. Much more geometric than floral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's another floral. their designers they had one designer who did nothing but design flowers um, that's what she did she was really good at flowers another designer only designed fish rugs and she was a real fisherwoman and she would go out and catch the trout and put it in the freezer and then paint it and draw it so one of the things I love about their designs is they have real accuracy you know you can tell it's a brook trout you know or, or whatever kind of flower it is did it make a difference to the people in Maine? 
Yes, it did. Yeah, Mrs. McAdoo gave a lot of people jobs, um, and in North Bennington, you know, there were over 50 rug hookers and also seven designers, people who worked in the office, people who finished the rugs. Um, yeah, and when the first um, a stream of Laotian refugees came to Vermont. They hired the Laotian refugees and they worked in their homes like the rest of us. They would give them a rug, like say a five foot by eight foot rug and the whole family would work on it and they would return it within a week. A rug that big. Um, you set it on a big frame and you can all work on it at once. They were very fast. <coughs> So this is like a big rug, six feet wide. Yeah. I love the, the scallop shape. That's a pure floral. <laughs> this is really considered a geometric with the Christmas tree. This one just blows my mind. I mean, the um, oh, the shaping in that each oops, each one of these little crossbars has like six different values of a color in it. But they would make anything and everything for custom rugs. People would often see, say, their Africa rug that I showed you, and want it bigger or smaller or a different shape. But they also made rugs of people's homes, of their pets. Um, all kinds of things. Amy, how long did they have their shop there? I remember going to a retail shop of theirs right across from the Equinox. Yeah. Was that in the 70s or 80s? And did they yeah. have that for a long time and as its retail store to augment their home custom business? Mm -hmm. that, that store in Manchester was actually a Frog Hollow Craft Center in Manchester. And they had a lot of rugs there. They didn't have their own shop there, but they actually had a shop in New York on Lexington Avenue for a number of years. Is that the one you mean? I live one in Manchester, but I mean the one in Lexington, yeah. New York as well. Yeah. 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 And the one I thought they just both had both of them. <laughs> the one they had in Lexington, they only had for a couple of years. And oh. that one, um, it was in the late 90s. I worked there in 99 for a winter, and it was really fun. And Preston is so creative to hang the rugs. Um, we hang them on, are you familiar with carpet tack strips? Um, mm -hmm. We would hang them on those, and Preston figured out how to put the car carpet tack strip on metal. He got his beautiful space there on Lexington Avenue and put metal on all the walls, painted it white, and all of the carpet tack boards that the rugs went on were magnetic. So you could just take it and go chunk and put it on the wall and hang the rug on it. So that's how they displayed the rugs. I mean, isn't that clever? Who would think of that? So I'm going to bore you with a little bit about myself. Um, I worked as a home rug, or home rug hooker for the McAdoo's from 80 to 85. And when I worked for them, they got asked by the Vermont State Craft Center here in Middlebury to teach a class and no one wanted to do it. And they said, oh, you do it. You're closer than anyone else. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do it. And I really didn't. Um, but I did. And um, it turned out that I absolutely loved <laughs> teaching. I just adored it. And um, it was so funny because it was a six-week class. And by about the third class, on the third week, I started thinking, they think I know what I'm talking about. And, and then I was like, oh, I think I do know what I'm talking about. So I just adored the teaching. Um, I started Red Clover Rugs in the basement of the Craft Center and did that for 10 years and had the pleasure of working with Suzanne Douglas, there, who's here with us today. Um, I sold that in 1995. Um, I invented my own punch needle in 1995, the Oxford punch needle, and I figured out that I could do just as well financially just selling the punch needle as I could selling supplies, kits, um, um, and all that kind of thing. So I, I stopped doing the red clover rugs. I started a punch needle teacher certification program. I mentioned that there was less than a handful of people teaching punch needle and I really wanted 
to see it thrive. I loved it so much. I thought we really need new teachers. So in 84, I had my first class with five teachers and now there are 110 Oxford certified instructors around the world in Great Britain and um, Ireland. Yeah. Um, I wrote a book on functional rock cooking because there wasn't a book. I got asked to write a book. There was no how-to, no basic technique. And um, in 2010, I had the most remarkable opportunity come up. When Cynthia and Preston retired, they sold McAdoo rugs to a young couple, um, the Turners from Nantucket. And sadly, the, Na the Nantucket couple um, went bankrupt in 2009, and everything went to auction. All of the patterns, all of the yarn, all of the notes for how much yarn was in every rug and what color and all, everything mm -hmm. went up for auction. And Cynthia and Preston knew <coughs> I wanted it and we went to the auction together and they said, okay, you've got to have the dye lists, you've got to have this, 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 and we're going to go make sure everything's there. And I took out a 0% interest credit card loan and knew exactly how much I could spend. And there was only one other person at the auction and he was the person um, who had actually made the business go bankrupt, um, Mr. Turner. So he was the only one I was bidding against. And um, to make a long story short, I wound up getting everything for an absolute bargain. I mean, it, was, it was phenomenal. Uh, I just couldn't believe my good fortune. So now I own over a thousand um, McAdoo rug patterns. And every pattern has exactly what we were given as home rug cookers. We have that map that shows what goes where. We have the yarn lists. We have all the dye formulas. I mean, we have everything. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, so I traveled to teach for 27 years, an itinerant rug cooking teacher. I had the pleasure of traveling all over. And I always said, when I get older, I'm going to start my own school. And um, about five years ago, I really started feeling older. <laughs> so um, I purchased a beautiful colonial home right on Route 30 in Cornwall. And now I'm really happy to have my own school. And we had the most phenomenal thing happen. And I'll talk more about it later. But the punch needle was discovered on Instagram and just blew up. I just want to show you some of my rugs. This was a commission I made for a family in Rochester, New York, and it tells the whole history of the family, starting with um, where Mr. Pearson was born in Rochester, New York, and their childhood horses, and Mrs. Pearson was from Philadelphia. There's the Liberty Bell. This is all their schools and colleges, where they got married, their first home. Um, going right up, telling their whole life story, their dogs, each child had a riser. It was really, really fun to make. And How long did that take? It took six months of designing and six months of hooking. And the designing was really hard because they gave me an envelope for each riser and said exactly what they wanted to go on it and then I worked from there. But this was before the internet so everything went back and forth through the mail. And they did things like um, one of the sons had, um, this is his riser with all these sport things that he liked and here's um, Trinity College. Um, you can't really see it, it's so small. but. They sent me a picture of the other side of Trinity College, and when they saw the picture, they said, well, that's not right. I mean, how am I supposed to know what the other side of Trinity College looks like? Anyway, the designing took six months, and then I had help punching, and I um, had four um, Bosnian refugees who helped me, and we had a lot of fun working on it together. So it's very busy going up, and it never occurred to me that this would happen, but look how calm it is going down. Oh, Isn't that nice? <laughs> I like it that way much better. <laughs> the biggest rug that I ever got to make was eight and a half wow. feet by 11 feet. It was for a family in Shelburne, Vermont. And they wanted an oak tree to symbolize the strength of their family. And the initials of everyone in the family are um, in the background, hidden in the spirals of the background. Um, wow. I'm trying to find one. 
Well, there's PDS, for example. Um, there is a little gnome hidden in the tree. There he is up there. Um, after they had it for about a month, I got a call from the owner. She was sobbing, and she said, I don't know what to do. She said, I left the puppy alone with the room. He only went back to sleep for about half an hour. It chewed an area about the size of my head. Oh, right there. It was completely gone. You know, a hole, you could look right through it. And my first instinct, because it was very expensive, was to reassure her. I said, don't worry, we can fix it. I have all the yarn. It won't be a problem at all. And she stopped crying. <laughs> and I don't know. And then I burst into tears. <laughs> Absolutely no idea how to fix it, no idea at all. But I called Preston McAdoo and they sent me beautiful directions for how to fix it. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, this rug I had a lot of fun with and it was actually in Senator Leahy's office um, in Washington. He came to Frog Hollow every year and picked out artwork um, for his office in Washington. And I liked it so much, I made it four times and um, was lucky to be able to sell them at Frog Hollow. And then I made one for my daughter um, with a nighttime scene. And this is another rug I did, um, a St. Stephen's Church in Middlebury here. Um, I don't know if any of you knew Father Terry and um, Dennis, his partner Dennis. They adopted a little girl, Chiara Rosa who's up here, and here she is with her two dads, oh. and Father Terry has his clerical collar, mm -hmm. and Dennis is wearing his triathlon clothes, and they are flying over, I hope you can recognize, Middlebury. So here's St. Stephen's and the Painter House. They didn't want the Congregational Church. <laughs> um, and the Middlebury Inn, and the gazebo, and Remember in the beginning I mentioned that it had to be backwards, so I got all of the buildings punched and Preston McAdoo came over and I was so excited to show him this because it was the first thing I did with my newest little teeny needle and very fine yarn and I looked at it and my blood ran cold. I had oh, not made it backwards. Oh. So if it was just some random make-believe town, it wouldn't have mattered if the church was on the wrong side of the gazebo, but it really does matter in a real town. So what I did was I had to start all over, but I cut out and saved um, the painter house in the Middlebury. Oh. Um, so I call these Middlebury through the looking glass. <laughs> so you've actually cut out those squares from the main rug and then it was on burlap? It was on cotton monk's cloth is what we used and I had to start completely over. Wow. I tried taking it out and punching the church from the other side and I just couldn't see it well enough. Do you ever use a mirror underneath just to see what you're I don't. That's a really good idea though. So um, these are dishes running away with spoons. I was at a craft show once and someone said, what are those, sperm and eggs? <laughs> and luckily there was someone else in the booth who said, you must have had a really warped child. <laughs> so in 2018 I invented my punch needle and the Craftsman's punch needle is a fantastic tool. Um, but I got carpal tunnel and tendonitis from it. Um, it just has a little lip to mm -hmm. press on. Here's the motion, mm -hmm. thousands of times, making commissions, eight, 10 hours a day, nothing unusual. So you're gripping it like a pencil, and it's got this teeny little lip that gives you a blister, and you're using the same set of hand muscles to go up and down, up and down, up and down. So I wore out my wrist and I wore out my elbow. I had to take a whole year off. Mm -hmm. And um, the only difference really with my punch needle is that it has a nice, can you see this? Okay. Mm -hmm. It has a nice big lip to push down on, and it has a bump. 
um, to pull up on. So you're actually using two different sets of hand muscles, one to push down and one to pull up. And it's, it's much fatter. And I'm so excited because I get thank you letters from people with terrible arthritis and people with hands and wrist pain who couldn't punch before who now they can. So I'm really excited about that. And here's the book. And I was just telling Bill, I just signed a contract two days ago to completely update this book um, and to do a second book. So when I purchased the McAdoo patterns, um, they all arrived in a U-Haul. And I just thought, what have I done? <laughs> you know, I mean, you can sort of see the shock in my face. Here they all are. And Preston oh, came to help me sort them. So, you know, at McAdoo Rugs, they were all in these nice little cubbies and mm -hmm. very under control. And when they arrived, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. But now they're all sorted. <laughs> Do you use them? Too? We use them, yes. At my school, we have all of them available um, for my students. And we also know how much yarn it takes for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, say they want the background to be one color, we can say, yes, you need eight ounces, whatever. So they are being used. We s recycled a couple of hundred of the custom ones. We just didn't have room for all of them. So um, say you had the Naughty Chickens rug, they had a two by three, they had a three by five, they had a five by six, they had an oval. So we got rid of the ones that were sort of duplicates because we knew we could recreate them. We found all kinds of treasures. This um, was a rug made for um, President and Laura Bush, and you can see their little Scotty dog here. Mm -hmm. So going through them was fascinating. They made rugs for two different presidents. And here's my school. And last summer it was so exciting. Um, this wonderful lady, Bevy, is blind, and she made a rug of her um, seeing eye dog. And I was able to help her by outlining the shape of the rug, and then she would fill it in. So first, I might outline the head, you know, and she would fill in the head. And this seeing eye dog actually belongs to um, this very nice lady here. Um, Janie, and he was a dog who could tell if you were about to have um, a diabetic um, blood sugar change, and it was remarkable. He could tell from the other side of the house and go running well, to her. Absolutely phenomenal, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. So the thing I love about Punch Needle is it's easy, it's fast, it's forgiving. Any mistake you make, it's really easy to fix. So in 2017, I was on the train coming home. My little granddaughter had just been born. I call her my good luck granddaughter. And you know how you can get the email on the train now? I got an email from someone saying, I posted um, a little video on the internet and it's been quite successful. Would you like to partner with me? And I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, everybody wants something for nothing. And what does this even mean, partnering? So I wrote back just a staller saying, what did you have in mind? Um, hoping I'd never hear from her again. <laughs> and um, that was on a Friday. On Monday, I went in and my employee, Heidi, had this stricken look on her face and she said, we got 39 orders today from all over the world. <laughs> Um, we sold out um, in overnight um, about 2,000 punch needles, everything we had in stock, and um, we made a thousand more, and those sold out overnight, and it, it was just insane. Last year we shipped to 52 countries, and um, I now have um, six employees, so it's it's really been phenomenal. This one lady. Um, Aruna from Bukow posted this little 20 second video and it got 449,000 hits um, overnight. And everyone was posting their friends. They had never seen Punch Needle before. And Aruna is incredibly hip and she's got her degree in fine arts so she does all kinds of things, embroidery, painting, sculpting. She's just a real inspiration. So 
When people saw Aruna doing it, as one person said, Aruna, you've made this cool. And so it's a whole new generation of people who've discovered it. My students range in age from 40 to um, 90, and my followers on Instagram are 25 to 35. And I have 20,000 followers. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Where was Aruna from? Sorry. Where was Aruna from? Aruna's from Toronto. And you can check and see where your followers are from. And my followers, the main city is Toronto because that's where she's from. New York, London, and Istanbul. And sometimes Istanbul rises to the top. And I think it's because they have such a strong um, background in road making. So we now have um, about 75 international stockists, um, as they call them, on um, Instagram world. There's a whole new Instagram lingo that we had to learn. I'm not a craftsperson, I'm a maker, for example. I just really have to get with it. <laughs> where are the, where are your uh, Our punch needles, um, you can turn that off, Mary. Our punch needles are made, um, assembled by us in Cornwall. I have eight sizes now, and the wooden handle is turned in Maine, and the metal point is made by a tool and die company in Oregon because my engineer um, was from Oregon. Um, and my husband Peter and I assembled them on the kitchen table. It's perfect. We assembled them on the kitchen table for 11 years, and then we hired um, Heidi Whipple, my employee, and she made them at home. And then the social media event happened, and now we have three assemblers. So, Didn't you originally just have one size? Yes. Mm -hmm. Originally, I, I, have, I have an old one. That, yes. Oh, yeah, it's yours, but it's... Yes. Originally, we made um, one I size. The was darker color. Um, the older ones were darker and they darken as they get older. Or we originally just made the number eight, which is a half inch loop, which is what the McAdoo's used. Um, and then I got a kind of yarn that didn't work as well at that height, so um, I made them a little bit shorter. And over time we've come up with different heights. And when you come up later, you can see I have this little chart um, that shows the eight different sizes and the, the heights of the loops. Um, I brought some rugs to show you, and I'm going to ask if someone could hold them up for me. I'm going to show you some McAdoo rugs first. This is the McAdoo shoe rug. And that was all done with punch? Everything I'm going to show you is all punch. Yeah. And this is one of my favorites, their fruit basket. And you know, it was derived from a theorem painting. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they did a lot is they would use multiple colors in the background. So this is actually um, four different shades of white and cream in the background. Oh, good. They're rugs. <laughs> the first rug that I made, I brought in and um, Preston put it on the floor and the phone rang and he walked across the room and stepped on it and I just went <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> But they are rugs, they're very sturdy. How do you clean them? These you can wash in the bathtub um, with oh. cold water and wool light or ivory liquid. The original McAdoo rugs, they cooked their yarn all day, basically boiled the yarn all day. So original McAdoo's you can wash in a front loader or washing machine with Tide, and they come out good as new. I would not do that with any more modern cooked rug. What about patterné and yarn? Patterné I would never put in the washing machine. I do that by hand. And red patterné and yarn bleeds. So always do that in cold water. This is a tree pin. Mm. Oh, that's so pretty. Mm -hmm. So these yarns aren't being made anymore, though, right? 
Um, so what's happened is when McAdoo closed, they were not being made, and I got all the dye formulas and just decided that's too much to start doing that. And we were very lucky. Um, Liz Williams, who was their master dyer, got a job with Melina White, who owns Seal Harbor Rug Company in Manchester, and she's doing all the dyeing. And Liz didn't need the formula. She, you know, could figure it all out. So we can now get um, beautiful McAdoo style yarn. Her palette is brighter. It was interesting because Preston visited Seal Harbor Rug Company and said, why didn't we have these colors? <laughs> How long is Liz going to keep doing it? <laughs> What's that? How long will she keep dying them? I don't know, but Melina's young. And Melina has learned from Liz, who is older, so I don't see Melina showing any sign of shopping, stopping. So are, those yarn, are the yarns available then? Yes, they are, through Seal Harbor, yes. Just, and we sell them at our school. We do. Okay. Yeah. And I designed um, a line of yarns as well that we sell Violet Jane rug yarns. So we have a lot of yarn at the school. Mrs. McAdoo, before she started rug hooking, um, had a sheep farm. And this is called Suffolk Sheep. And she said that the baby lambs really do sit on their mother's back. <laughs> You've seen that, haven't you, Judy? That background, if you turn if you turn it around and show the other side, you can see all the different shades of green in the background. It just makes it more oh, interesting. One thing that always sets them apart is the amount of fluidity and, and flow that's in the backgrounds, which I just think is just so exquisite. How do, how do you develop that? That's a skill I'd love to have. <laughs> yeah. Mine look kind of plotty. Oh, <laughs> so much of it is the design, and this, the skill is getting your stitches all even. Um, mm -hmm. The stitches are very uniform. Um, when Cynthia McAdoo, the younger, took it over from Mrs. McAdoo, also Cynthia, um, there was no prescribed stitch size, um, how big to make the stitches. And Cynthia, the younger, was a knitter. And the first thing she did was say, we need a stitch gauge. We need to decide how big to make the stitches. So we were all given a piece of paper with a square hole cut out of it. And we were told, you know, have four stitches to the inch for filling in and six stitches to the inch for outlining. So, um, one of the reasons Cynthia wanted to do that too was say one person was making a rug and they got the flu and someone else had to finish it. You couldn't tell who had worked on a rug and often on the bigger rugs, like the Laotian families I mentioned, lots of people were working on it at once. So that's how they were um, made so uniformly. And a well-made punch needle rug should be as beautiful on the back as on the front. If you have um, white spaces showing on the back, they're called holidays, and you shouldn't have any holidays. Um, this is a, a traditional McAdoo rug that I made with, um, with my own yarns and colors. Mm. So people, my students have so much fun taking these antique um, designs. I hate to think of them as antique, <laughs> yeah. um, but they are, um, and using modern colors. Once you wash it in the cold water, in, how, how do you dry it? Do you just you would lay it on a towel like you would a sweater, okay? And they take about three days to dry. I'll come over. Obviously, do it in really nice weather. I, mean, I found out where the term holiday comes from. I looked it up in the dictionary. If you miss a little spot in a rug, they call it a holiday. I looked in the old Oxford dictionary, and it goes back to the um, 1600s. I'm sorry, the 16th century, if you were tarring a boat and you missed a spot, it was a holiday. And I've since met um, all kinds of people who use the term. One was a sailor, and he said when he was swabbing the deck, if you missed a spot, it was a holiday. Another was a window washer, and the other was a painter. So I thought it was just a rug hooking term, but it isn't. As a teacher, I had to keep coming up with new things to teach my students. Um, so I tried all kinds of things. This is just punching directly onto wool fabric. 
And I also learned to punch with fabric strips. The early punch needles were used for yarn or fabric strips, and the early hooked rugs, they used whatever they had. You know, fabric, yarn, they used it all. They wouldn't waste a single strand of the burlap. You know, they'd hook that in. So I was really excited to get to try strips um, as well. This piece combines yarn and strips. When I pass it around, you'll be able to see the moon is strips of wool fabric, and the background is yarn. Now, could you use your uh, needle and still? Yes. Yes, you can. This I'll pass around. It shows the eight different heights of the Oxford punch needles. <laughs> and I always wanted to make a carpet bag, so this is a little carpet bag I made for myself. <laughs> but I'm not going to use it till I retire, because <laughs> I don't want it to get all beat up. And the thing I'm most excited about now is learning fine shading, which is something that they've done in traditional rug hooking for a long time. You use very, very fine yarn or fine um, cuts of um, wool fabric. This is a Jacobean pattern and has eight different values for the flowers. So it's similar to like a cruel embroidery shading. And then um, I've tried to do a little bit more realistic shading in the leaves. So. This is all I want to do now is shading. And I have one more rug to show you, but I don't think I can show it on TV. Nope. <laughs> I'll have to edit it out. So shall I say thank you very much for coming and then <laughs> we can edit this out. Um, this is a, a mermaid rug and we just took it to a show in Florida and we did put little seashells on her to cover her up, but I thought she was extremely lovely. Well, it's pretty. I love the color. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about what I know about punch needle rock hooking. Does anyone have any questions? Where do we sign up? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you can go right to my website to see what we're doing, amyoxford.com. Um, I didn't even bring any cards. I didn't think of it, but. Yeah, we've got lots of classes listed online. We have a Monday night group that meets from I think it meets from six to eight thirty every Monday. We have a Thursday daytime group. We're about to start um, sip and punch. There's been requests for that. A little wine and punching in the evening. Um, but we have uh, one day. Um, three day classes, we have five day retreats, we have all kinds of things available. We also give private lessons, so if any of our classes don't work for you, we can show you the basics in a really short period of time. Oh, and I forgot, would you like to see how it works? Yes. <laughs> so with punch, you have to work on a frame, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy, it can be an embroidery hoop. But this frame has um, teeth on it, like a dog brush. You know, can you see that? Um, this kind of thing. And it makes it really easy to put your, your backing on and get it nice and tight. And we work on the back. So this is the right side. And this is the back side. And you take your punch needle. And threading it is really easy. You go through the eye of the needle and make a long tail. And then to get it in the punch, you just yank on it and it pops right in. And you pull on it till you have a little short tail. And then to do the punching, again, you're working on the wrong side on the back. 
you just punch it down and move it forward and punch it. And I hate to say it, but that's about all there is to it. It's really easy. Um, the trick is you have to always punch the needle all the way down as far as it'll go. And when you lift up, you can't lift it up high. You have to drag it along. If you lift it up, it'll pull out. So you also want to aim the needle in the direction that you're going. So in other words, this is facing forward. What the tool does, let's see if I can do this. What the tool does is it pushes out an end and folds it. Can you see that? So it pushes it, makes it just the right length. And then when you bring it back, it folds it in half to make it into a loop. So the traditional rug hook pulls up loops and we punch down loops. So, Amy, this one, yes. where, where this is strips, yes, on the, it is the right side. <laughs> some of them are not loops, some of them are the end of the strip. Yes, that's right. It doesn't pull out? So, that's a great question. Hook drugs don't have knots, um, so technically you could take one of those ends and pull it. Um, same with whether it's strips or with yarn, if you have a um, a cat that needs mm -hmm. or a puppy that chews, you can pull them out. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really true for so many rugs, unfortunately. But the thing I love about it is that it's really easy to fix mistakes mm -hmm. if you don't like what you've done or you want to change the color. It's really easy to undo it and go again. So from a design point of view, that's a wonderful thing. The thing I love the most about punch needle is how painterly it is, you know. Every mm -hmm. other fiber art I've ever done, you're working with a grid. You know, if you're a weaver, you have your warp mm -hmm. and your weft. If you're a knitter, you go in rows, um, cross stitch, you're going in holes. Um, needlepoint, you're working in holes, so to get a circle with needlepoint, you have to go up, over, up, over, mm -hmm. up, over, right? Um, but with this, you can just punch a, a curve, you can do, anything and that's really the thing I love about it is how painterly it is and how it lends itself to any form of artistic expression. So how would you change your color? So oh good question. To change a color you just lift your needle up and pinch the yarn so you don't pull out what you've just done. Slide the needle out of the way cut it off, and then you just stuff that end through to the other side. And same thing, see where I started? I've got that little tail. Can you guys see? I'm sorry, it's kind of far away. And you just stuff that through as well. So all of your long ends wind up on this side, and then you just loop, and they don't show, they just kind of sink in and disappear. That's what amazes me about that. Yes. <laughs> Um, you can take them out if you look, but they look just as yes. even as anything else. So um, the skill really is, aside from the artistry, um, the artistic part of it, the skill is getting your stitches really uniform sizes. We talked about having um, four stitches to the inch, so you just measure your stitches as you go. And I don't count holes. I don't have very good vision, so I punch a few and measure and, you know, adjust. And we try to have about seven rows to the inch, so you can count your rows that way as well. But once you get the hang of it, it's muscle memory. You, know, you don't have to think about it, you just do it. The basic materials on the frame? Yes. Yep. Um, is that an adjustable frame? This one is just one size. There are lots of adjustable frames, so, yeah. Is that carpet tacking underneath there, and then you, how did you, this oh, is make, make your, your basic top. You can, you can buy that carpet strips. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what, what I, I use. But then I didn't have a nice little padded 
<laughs> so when I first learned from McAdoo, we used the carpet tack strips, which is those little nails. They're spaced about yeah. a quarter inch apart. That's what I had. And they really worked well. They were cheap, but they were dangerous. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, and you couldn't get near the edge. No. Yeah. So oh, I yeah. switched to oh. ripper strip. Look how easily this comes off. Those oh. of you who are familiar with the other. <laughs> Um, this is, um, it's called gripper strip and it's similar to a dog brush and it has so many of these little teeth so <coughs> close together yeah. that it isn't really sharp but it, it grips the backing. It is sharp on the corners where we've cut it but you can use a frame like this and move your work if you've used nice heavy rub yarn or if you've used strips of fabric, um, sturdy strips of fabric. Oh, would you like to see a strip of fabric punch? I could just keep going on, don't you? <laughs> you know, pull me off. Would you like to see a strip of fabric? Sure. Okay. Then, Bill, don't let me talk anymore. So to thread a strip of fabric, you just do the same thing that you would with yarn. You go through here, make a long tail, and it just sort of threads sideways all by itself beautifully. Start with a little short tail. And punch along. I'm going to go in about every other hole in the mom's cloth. It's beautiful, even though mm -hmm. wow. pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Do you use a separate fabric for binding? I was trying to figure it out looking at the back of this. Oh, you just fold it? All I do is cut it off two inches all the way around. So I'll cut it here and then I'll fold it, fold it under. And I'm really excited because when this internet <laughs> explosion happened, I started a YouTube channel and I have a whole series of how-to videos now. There's 16 on now, six about to go on, and we're doing, I'm doing a series of 32 with all the basics, how to punch. And I'm about to put on how to hem. Oh, it's in the can, as they say, but it's <laughs> But there are all different kinds of ways of finishing a rug. Um, you can whip the edge or do a, um, a crochet edge. There are all kinds of beautiful ways of finishing rugs. Any other questions? If anyone would like to try this, I've got this little try me frame. You're welcome to give it a go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.